Jai Radha Bhagava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Bhagava Kunja Bihari Jaya Gopi Janavalaba Giri Vara Dalhari Giri Gopi Janavalaba Giri Vara Dalhari Yes, so the Nandana Prajadana Jamuna Tira Havana Chahan Hidamu Jamuna Tira Havan, 
राधे ध्याय राधा माधवा कुंज विहारे ध्याय राधा माधवा कुंज विहारे Bhagavad Gita, Chapter 8, Text Number 14, attaining the Supreme. It's a very, very lengthy purport. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Annaya Chaita Satatam. Yoma Smarati Nitya Saha. Tashyaham Sulabha Partha Nitya Yuktasya Yoginaha Annaya Chaita Satatam Yomasmarati Nitya Saha Tashyaham Sulabha Partha Nitya Yuktasya Yoginaha Ananya Chaita Satatam Yomam Smarati Nitya Saha Tashyaham Sulabha Partha Nitya Yuktasya Yoginaha Tasya ham sulabha bhartha Ladies, Ananya Chaita, without deviation of the mind, Satatam, always, Ya, anyone who, Mam, me, Krishna, Smarati, remembers, Nitya Saha, regularly, Tasya, to him, Aham, I am, 
Sulab. Sulab. Sulab, yeah, Sulab. Very easy to achieve. Partha. O Sanaprita. Nitya. Regularly. Yuktasya. Engaged. Yoginaha. For the devotee. So Krishna is speaking. For one who always remembers me without deviation, I'm easy to obtain, O Sanaprita, because of his constant engagement in devotional service. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada's purport. This verse especially describes the final destination attained by the unalloyed devotees who serve the personality, extreme personality of Godhead. <laughs> So what is that final destination? Uh, one remembers Krishna always, and one is in fixed in constant devotional service. Previous verses have mentioned four different kinds of devotees, the distressed, the inquisitive, those who seek material gain, and the speculative philosophers. Hmm. So in the previous verses we got people come to the Lord out of material distress. They're curious. They want some material remuneration. And those are actually uh, philosophers who are seeking knowledge of the absolute truth. So these four categories come to me, Krishna says. He, dis he brings it down just to these four categories. These four are those who come to me. So everyone who comes to Krishna is in one of these four categories. The speculative philosophers is a different way of explaining that those who are actually seeking knowledge of the absolute truth. Different processes of liberation have been also described. Karma yoga. So what is karma yoga? Who knows? What's the difference between bhakti yoga and karma yoga? Who knows? Some. And then, and then, and then what? That's that's karma. But what is karma yoga? I I didn't catch it. Offering the reason, yeah, you you work according to the way you want to work, and then you offer the results to Krishna. What's the difference between karma yoga and bhakti yoga? So karma yoga is motive. So both are working for the Supreme, but what is what is the difference? Because the yoga means to connect with the Supreme. So what's the difference between those who work in karma and those who work in bhakti? Bhakti is meant to satisfy Krishna, yes, and karma is meant to... Yeah. So you do some work, and you give the part of the results to Krishna, and you take part. In other words, you, it's dividing the results between you and Krishna. That's karma yoga. Or you might even say karma yoga is, I like to do this, so I'll do this for Krishna. Whereas bhakti means, what is the spiritual master giving me in terms of my devotional service? No. One's working under authority, one's offering the results of the fruits of their activities based on what they would like to offer. Okay, so then we have karma yoga. So what is jnana yoga? Next one is mentioned. What's jnana yoga?
So Gana means what? What is Gana? What's the word Gana means? Knowledge. So what is so what is Gana Yoga? Well, their goal. What is the goal of the Ganis? Mm -hmm. Liberation. Liberation in what way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gana Yoga means to speculate on the nature of the Absolute Truth and detach oneself from all material activities with a desire of uh, merging into the impersonal. Becoming one with the Lord. Become one with the bodily effulgence of the Lord like that. <laughs> and then he has, says here, what is Hatha Yoga? So what is Hatha Yoga? Where does Hatha Yoga come from in terms of where do we find Hatha Yoga mentioned in the scriptures? Everybody knows what Hatha Yoga is, right? What is it? What's the goal of Hatha Yoga? That's mystic yoga. But what is Hatha Yoga? What's the goal of Hatha Yoga? Or what is the purpose of Hatha that's that's pranayam. That's part of the same system, but it's different. Huh? Hatha yoga? No, <laughs> not exactly. What is what is the what is the ninefold process of bhakti? Uh, what is the ninefold uh, yoga process? Uh, what is the astanga yoga? Who can name the nine, the eight 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 features of astanga yoga? What's the first one? Yama, what's second? Niyama. Niyama. What's next? Asana. asana. So asana is hatha yoga. Mm -hmm. Performing asanas. And then from what's after asana? Pramanayam. What's after that? Dharana. Dharana. And then? Dhyana. Dhyana. And then? Samadhi. So Hatha is the part of the yoga process of the Astanga. Krishna talks about it in the sixth chapter. And so what is the uh, so what is Hatha Yoga? It's part of the eightfold uh, eightfold Astanga yoga process. What what does it actually do within that process? Yama it means to uh, accept things that are conducive to the meditation and niyama means to reject it. So what is asana? What's the purpose of doing asanas? What's the purpose? Hmm? Huh? Yeah, you got it. You're lining the body and mind. That's the purpose. That's the purpose of yahatha yoga is to align the body and mind, fix the mind and on the process of uh, attaining the supreme, and then following the, rem the remaining process with 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 pranayam. What is pranayam? Breathing. So, but particularly, we breathe every day. But is that pranayam? <laughs> huh? Conscious breathing, according to. Yeah, but there's a there's a science of pranayama, how to how to use pranayama in the in the factual way. Mm -hmm. So then to they call it drilling the respiration like that. That's how it says like that. Using the breathing process after fixing the mind and body in posture and then breathing in a certain way. Um, there is different types of pranayam with different effects like that. Uh, kumbhaka, drechaka, and what is putraka? <laughs> you know those three? No. <laughs> well, kumbhaka is one is. <laughs> so. One is bringing the air in, the other one is holding the air, 
and the third one is letting the air out. So you can do that by switching the nostrils like this. Now, Prabhupada mentions to help to control the mind, which is a good te feature of chanting Hare Krishna, is that you can use this pranayam feature of kumbhaka, rechaka, re and putraka, I think it is. It's mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Try that before you chant. Take a big breath. It becomes easy after a while, you can just, and when you do that, what are you actually doing? You're controlling the mind. So if you can do that every day, keep it as long as you can in the holding position, and then gradually let it out. Don't go, <laughs> no, no, not like that. <laughs> just, and then you let it out then the mind becomes, it starts to slow down. One of the reasons why we can't chant Japa is our mind is too fast. Because it's going too fast, it's moving in different directions. You need to slow the mind down. So this, this breathing exercise helps to slow the mind down. And then the next is dhyana, which means to fix the mind. And then dharana. What is dharana? Meditation, concentration. Through meditation comes concentration. Through concentration comes samadhi. Samadhi lasts two hours and 24 minutes, I think. So if you can focus something on something for two hours, it's 144 minutes. That's what it really is. 144 minutes is actually the first stage of samadhi. I like that. So the idea is to focus the mind on the supreme within the heart through these eightfold processes like that, okay? That process is an authorized form of God realization, and Krishna mentions it in the sixth chapter. But he doesn't emphasize it, and Srila Prabhupada clarifies it in the purport by explaining that in this age we can't do the astanga process. No. It's too difficult for devotees to do. But if you can practice some of the features of the Astanga process, especially asana, and um, uh, pranayam, and uh, like that, and also the other, how many you can pra practice, it will help you when you're chanting of japa and keeping your mind fixed on something like that. Our problem is the mind is restless. It goes from things to things. We can't keep our mind controlled. Just like he's doing something and everybody's watching him, right? <laughs> so, so because anything happens in the room, we get diverted, right? It's like, it's so easy. That's the nature of the mind. So then we have to key, learn to keep the mind fixed on the object, what you call it, which is actually Krishna, like that. Okay. The principles of these yoga systems have some bhakti added. So Prabhupada said that karma yoga, jnana yoga, hatha yoga, they have bhakti added. But this verse particularly mentions ananya bhakti or pure bhakti without any mixture of karma, jnana, and hatha. That's pure bhakti. As indicated by the word ananya cheta in pure bhakti, so anya, ananya means unalloyed or pure devotion using the cheta in this case refers to the mind. So in pure bhakti yoga, the devotee desires nothing but Krishna. A pure devotee does not desire promotion to heavenly planets. So 
So if you go to a heavenly planet, it describes in the Srimad Bhagavatam, especially in the, uh, what is the third canto, describes a little bit about the nature of the heavenly planets, what it's like there. But, and you might think after reading that, that's not so bad. You got beautiful women there, and you got beautiful men, and you have hardly any disease. Coronavirus can't get in there. <laughs> and uh, you live quite long. <laughs> and uh, the sense gratification, like everything is cooked in ghee in the heavenly planet. No oil. <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's mentioned. When one heavenly damsel came to the earth, she connected with one earthly king and she said, I only take ghee, that's all. <laughs> so yeah, so that's not the kind of ghee we have here. It's really good ghee there, it's high class. <laughs> so everything is materially nice, you might say. So one might read and think, wow, not so bad. You know, I could live there for, you know, 10,000 earth years. But nit, uh, what is it? Shinya punya. Oh, what is that verse? You know that? Shinya punya. Sh shinya. No, no. Shinya. Shinya punya. No. One. Shinya punya. One. When one's pious activities are. Exhausted, one falls down again back to the material world. So the heavenly realm is not eternal. And also, sometimes there are difficulties in the heavenly realms. One demigod will go and steal another demigod's wife. <laughs> and so <laughs> happens there too. <laughs> yeah, Brihaspati, his wife got stolen by the moon god Chandra. And so. So they have their, you know, they have their, uh, you know, affairs there too. <laughs> uh, but you can drink soma ras there. Nice, it's good, tastes good. It's, it's like the best of all, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, mixtures of nectar like that. It's the best, what do we call it? Uh, best, best, uh, Lossies you can get. <laughs> Sweet, juicy, energizing, like that. And so everything is nice, but then those who actually have a taste or understand bhakti, they think heavenly planets, boy, that's hell. <laughs> that's hell, yeah. Because you forget about Krishna. <laughs> And you also get the idea that, you know, everything is okay. But then again, material life is still uh, always there. <laughs> and it's not permanent. So, yeah, so promotion to the heavenly planets, one does not desire that. Nor does one seek oneness with the Brahma, Brahma Jyoti or salvation or liberation from material entanglement. So there's a beautiful verse by Prabodhananda Saraswati Kaivalya Narakar Ketan was it Pushpa Akash Pushpayate Akash Pushpayate Akash means sky and Pushpa means flower so the heavenly planets are like sky flowers <laughs> there's no such thing as a sky flowers flowers don't grow in the sky so it's, the word is phantasmagoria. And although it sounds so nice, it's just a phantasmagoria. It's more like an illusion. And kaivalya, liberation, oneness with the Supreme, is uh, niraka, which is hell. But the word nira, niraka means hell. <laughs> like that. So Prabodhananda Saraswati gives a nice verse. 
I don't know if this verse is mentioned anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita. Can someone find that verse? Kaivalya. Let's see if it's in the listing of verses here. The first word is Kaivalya. K-A-I. Do you have it, uh, Ananta? Ka Kaivalya is the first word. A A L It's not in the Gita. Alex, you got it? Kalvalya Nara Kasate. Yeah, that's it. Kaivali is the first word. It's a real powerful verse. Prabodhananda. We getting anywhere? Okay, when you find it, we'll bring it up. So that verse, Prabhupada really, he just summarizes the verse by speaking the meaning of the verse here. A pure devotee does not desire promotion to heavenly planets, nor does he desire oneness with Brahma Jodi or salvation or liberation from material entanglement. The Bodhi doesn't care about the material happiness or distress. The Bodhi is fixed in, Chaita, in serving the Lord. He says, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the pure devotee is called Nishkam. So Kam means desire and Nish means without, which means he has no desire for self-interest. Perfect peace belongs to him alone not to them who strive for personal gain. So personal gain is the feature of the material world where a devotee is thinking, uh, my gain is my relationship with Krishna. And therefore one who has Krishna has everything and one who has everything doesn't, and doesn't have Krishna has only has only struggle, that's all. Whereas a jnana yogi, karma yogi, or hatha yogi, has his own selfish interest, a perfect devotee has no desire other than please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, the Lord says that for anyone who, has unflinching devo who is unflinchingly devoted to him, he is easily attained. A pure devotee always engages in devotional service to Krishna in one of the various personal features. Now Prabhupada describes, Krishna has various plenary expansions, incarnations as Rama and the Sringa, Ramadi Murti Sukala Niyamena Tishtana Navatara Akaro Bhuvaneshu Kinchu Krishna Swayam Samabhavat Paramam Pamanyo Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bhajami that the ver verse describes that mm, there are many, many manifestations or expansions of Krishna known. Rama, Nishringa, Varaha, so many. A devotee can choose to fix his mind in loving service on any of these transcendental forms of the Supreme Lord. Such a devotee meets with none of the problems that plague the practitioners of other yogas. Bhakti yoga is very simple and pure and easy to perform. Everyone agree, right? What makes bhakti hard? What makes it easy? Some people say, well, devotional service is, is very difficult, and others say it's very easy. So which is it? Some people say it's very simple for the simple. Complex. complex for the complex, yeah. Okay, but there is a more 
Well, exact definition of the difference between what makes it easy. That's correct also. If you're simple, it's easy. But if you're not so simple, you complicate the easy. <laughs> bhakti is easy. So, but what makes bhakti easy and what makes bhakti difficult? There, there's one, one characteristic you need that makes it easy and without it, it's difficult. Humility, that's important. But it's, there's another term that's mentioned. That's nice. <laughs> compassion? Well, if you're compassionate, yeah, but you also might be misled, though. <laughs> Okay, that's good. But in the execution of bhakti, what makes it easy? What makes it difficult? Everybody had a Veda. Anybody have a Veda base? Yeah. Uh, go to fourth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. Who's fast now? We need somebody really fast. Fourth canto, eighth chapter. Huh? But that's not the whole, that's not it. <laughs> Although that will bring about this quality that is necessary. Prabhupada, who wants 4, 8, 34? 4, uh, 4, 8, let me see. 4, 8, 30. No, I'm sorry, 4, 8, 30, not 4, 8, 34. Read the purport, though. It's in the purport. Now you have decided to undertake the mystic process of meditation under the instruction of your mother, just to achieve the mercy of the Lord. But in my opinion, such austerities are not possible for any ordinary man. It is very difficult to set aside the Supreme Personality of God. That's the whole purport? No, I mean, this is the translations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so simultaneously, very easy and very difficult to perform. Okay. Okay, if you're determined and sincere, it's easy. If you're not, uh. so if you can access or bring about your sin the sincere sincerity with determination, or determination with sincerity, both, <laughs> then you will reach the goal of perfection in due course of time. So then again, what makes determination and what takes away from determination? That's that's a very important principle. Yeah. And but what about your own activities makes you more determined or takes away from your determination? Hmm? Yeah, that's there too. That's there. Well, so if you have faith, you you can develop the more determination. If you don't have faith, then your determination is. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's also correct. I'm looking for a specific thing. The 
The more you gauge in sense gratification, the more, the less you are determined, and the more you give up sense gratification, the more you become determined. <laughs> that's the that's the principle. <laughs> Especially sex life. Those who can give up sex life, they become very determined in their process of Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so that determination is fueled or supported by relinquishing sense gratification. And of course, as was mentioned, in association devotees, we become more determined. By following the instructions of the spiritual master, we have we become more determined. What does the spiritual master say? Give up sense gratification. <laughs> you can't water the 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 uh, you can't put water on the fire when you're trying to build the fire. So when our sense uh, material sense gratification waters down our determination, and then makes the process very difficult. <laughs> Are hard to execute. <laughs> so that's that's the feature that's important here, that to become very determined. And when one understands that sense gratification doesn't give you happiness, then it becomes easier to give it up like that. So what is sense gratification? That 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 anything that's not connected with Krishna. <laughs> Anything that's not connected with Krishna is considered in the p category of what we say um, outside of the process of bhakti. In other words, things that are not favorable for our devotional service. These, these things should be given up. So what would be an example of things that are not favorable that we like to do? Watch television, right? <laughs> What else do we like to do that's not so favorable? Huh? Hmm? Association with non-devotees. Yeah, that's, that's the main one. If we associate with non-devotees in a desire to develop friendship or relationships with them, then we will find it very... Prabhupada said, you will fall down immediately. That, that's, that's actually the process of falling down. As soon as you start associating with non-devotees, then you, you start losing the appreciation of devotee association. You think, oh, the non-devotees, they're not so judgmental like devotees are. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to hang out with the non-devotees, but the devotees, oh, poo, boy, they make it tough sometimes. <laughs> okay, so association with the devotees, that's a good one. All right, such a devotee meets with none of the problems that plague the practitioners of the other yogas. Bhakti yoga is very simple and pure and easy to perform. Okay, again, Prabhupada mentions the easy. One can begin by chanting Hare Krishna. The Lord is merciful to all, but as we already explained, he is especially inclined to those who always serve him without deviation. The Lord helps such devotees in various ways. As stated in the Kathya Upanishads, Yam ivaisya renuti tap tena labhyas tasyaisya atma rir renuti tanu shwam. One who is fully surrendered and engaged in devotional service to the Supreme Lord can understand the Supreme Lord as he is. Now here's the key verse. In the Bhagavad Gita 10.10, Tadami buddhi yogam tam. The Lord gives such a devotee sufficient intelligence so that ultimately the devotee can attain him in his spiritual kingdom. So if you want Krishna, you really want Krishna, Krishna will give you the intelligence how to attain him. But if you want Krishna and Maya, then it's pretty hard to hear Krishna. We want, the idea is to come to the plot, I only want Krishna. 
The specific qualification of a pure devotee is that he is always thinking of Krishna without deviation and without considering the time or place. There should be no impediments. He should not be able to he should be able to carry out his service anywhere at any time. So here's a qualification that's important. Wherever we are, we and whoever however we with, we can always engage in devotional service. Because it's explained, devotional service is not part of the material energy. And therefore, anywhere you are, you can always chant Hare Krishna. You can always remember Krishna. You can always do something connected with Krishna. Like that. Okay. Some say that devotees should remain in a holy places like Vrindavan or some holy town where the Lord lived. But a pure devotee can live anywhere even in Ljubljana, and create the atmosphere of Vrindavan. <laughs> oh yeah, that's what it says here. <laughs> it's my, my particular book has that. In. <laughs> and, and create the atmosphere of Vrindavan by his devotional service. It was Sri Advaita who told Lord Chaitanya, wherever you are, O Lord, that is Vrindavan. So Vrindavan is two things. It's a state of consciousness and it's, it's actually a holy place. So one who lives with Krishna always it, it has developed the Vrindavan consciousness. And that's, not, that's no different. So one who is actually in Vrindavan conscious and one who lives in Vrindavan who is not in Vrindavan conscious, the person who is in Vrindavan conscious is connected on the spiritual platform. So going to a holy place doesn't necessarily mean you'll be holy unless your consciousness is coming with you, the right consciousness. Hmm. As indicated by the words satatam and nitya saha, always and regularly, every day, a pure devotee constantly remembers Krishna and meditates on him. So devotee meditates and... It's not like we chant our rounds and then we forget about Krishna the rest of the day. <laughs> the idea of ur -ur japa is to strengthen the mind in Krishna and then become more focused throughout the day on Krishna. These are qualifications of the pure devotee who the Lord is most easily attainable. Bhakti yoga is the system that the Gita recommends among all others. Generally, the bhakti yogas are engaged in five different ways. Sata, santa bhakta, neutrality, dasya, servitorship, sakya, friendship, vatsalya, parent, madhurya, conjugal lover. Any of these ways, the pure devotees can constantly engage in transcendental service to the Lord and cannot forget the Supreme Lord. And so for him, the Lord is easily attained. So who knows what is shanta bhakti? What is neutrality in devotional service? How do you become engaged in the neutral aspect of devotional service? What are some of the uh, symptoms or what are some of the features of neutrality? Yeah, exactly. If if you're taking darshan of the Lord, that's that's shantaras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's also shantaras. Yeah. So sometimes the impersonalists, but they say they are in also in shantaras because they do no service, no practical service. So they. Somewhere else? That means you're not fully engaged in service. Your mind is the central, central feature of the, of the yoga process. So mind is meant to engage the senses in the service of the Lord. So the mind, if the mind is not connected in, in any way in the service, or it goes in and out of the service and is diverted away, that means 
the, your bhakti is somewhat uh, what we call it flickering bhakti <laughs> it's not steady bhakti just like if you're doing something just like now if you're listening to class but then you're thinking well after class there must there might be pizza somewhere <laughs> So you're not really constantly in the class. You're half here and half somewhere else. So when the mind is fixed and it's fo focused on the service that you're engaged in, then you're in. Then you're then you're what we say absorbed. And so with body, mind, words, these are the three features we have. Mm -hmm. Like that. So, yeah, the idea is to bring the mind around because that's the main per person like that. That's why we say, sometimes we say, hey, you're spaced out. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> you might be doing something, but your mind is somewhere else. <laughs> it's good to be focused on what you're doing. That is devotional service like that. And if the mind rolls away, bring it back. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, whenever and wherever the mind uh, wanders due to its unsteady and flickering nature, because Krishna gives you the understanding the mind is unsteady and it flickers, he says, then bring it back under the self. So every time you, you notice, your intelligence notices that your mind is not connected, then you bring the mind to where it should be. Sometimes devotees make mistakes. They're doing something, but their mind is somewhere else. I do that sometimes. Like yesterday, I was I was pouring water into the cup that I use for pouring water for the deities. But instead of pouring it into the cup I poured the water in, I was pouring it into the cup that I pour the water after I offer to the deities. So then I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> Pouring it into the wrong cup. And I know the difference, but because my mind wasn't thinking of what I was doing, I did something different. <laughs> so that can happen, you know. But if you're on the altar, you can't be like that. <laughs> because then you get then you get offenses. Deity worship is not you can't you have to be very attentive to deity worship. <laughs> Okay, so we have one person demonstrating meditation here. Mi Mishra, oh, okay, okay. Thank you for giving us the demonstration of Hatha Yoga. Okay, uh, Sastanga Yoga. <laughs> so, Prabhupada would say, sleep 13 hours a day, but don't sleep in class. That's what he said. That's an exact statement. <laughs> but this class is so boring. All right. But some, somehow stay with it. It's almost over. A pure devotee cannot forget the Supreme Lord for a moment. A pure devotee cannot forget the Supreme Lord for a moment. And similarly, the Supreme Lord cannot forget his pure devotee for a moment. Such is a loving relationship between the two. This is the great blessing of the Krishna Kasa's process of chanting the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So Prabhupada ends the purport. After going through different things you should do and different things you shouldn't do, he ends with the ultimate principle of remembering the, the Lord, and that is chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Okay, any questions or comments? <laughs> yes, Urugai. Uh, Maharaj, you were mentioning sincerity. 
uh, again uh, how um, now uh, so insincerity is conscious, con con consciously deciding for uh, life or an illusion or I mean that that's how I understand Sin sincerity how means I want to be Krishna conscious and I'll do whatever it takes to become Krishna conscious that's sincerity if you say I want to be Krishna conscious, but you don't want, it, but you're not willing to do what's necessary, then you're insincere. <laughs> That's all. I want to be Krishna conscious, and I'll do whatever I can to become whatever I'm supposed to do. What I whatever I, requires for me to become Krishna conscious, I'm willing to do it. That's sincerity. But, but then I look at my neighbor and he, he got it so easy. He's more Christian conscious than I am, but his material circumstances are more favorable. He has nice ashram and he's very Christian conscious. And then I, I, I think, uh, oh, uh, maybe, maybe Christian demands uh, more. Uh, no, if you, look towards, if you look for others in, the, in terms of their material situation, you're not seeing the process properly. As, as is explained, no material situation is uh, can block one's Krishna conscious. You can be Krishna conscious in any situation, either in a palace or under a tree. Prabhupada said, if you desire to live in a palace rather than being under the tree, that's a material attachment. If you desire to live under a tree and not in a palace, that's a material attachment. <laughs> so in other words, what do I have to do to become Krishna conscious? You don't have, if you look at your neighbor, they have their situation. It may not be the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to find out, look at yourself see what you need, and then uh, go about. Like everybody has certain personalities, so you don't have to change your personality to be a devotee. You simply have to engage that personality in devotional service. You don't have to be like anyone else. You have to be yourself and be Krishna conscious. Sometimes we use a little humorous statement. Be yourself because all other positions are already taken. <laughs> you can't be anybody else but who you are. <laughs> you can use, you can look at others to be inspired by some of their qualities and their activities, but still, you have to be yourself. And each and every person has the capacity to be fully Krishna conscious, no matter who you are mm -hmm. or what your material situation is. Mm -hmm. But then again, coming back to that, what do I need to become Krishna conscious? That's all. And Krishna will provide it as soon as you move in that direction. And Krishna is also telling you what you need. He's telling you when you come to class. He's telling you in your association of devotees. He's telling you even through the association of the material energy, he tells you many times what you need and what you should not do. <laughs> Krishna is with us all the time, encouraging us in the, in the way that we need to be encouraged. Just like today. So I didn't want to give class tonight because I had so many things to do. So I wrote a letter to Ananta and he said, Phew. that was his first word. <laughs> he said, you're on the schedule. <laughs> the devotees are going to, they're, they're going to come and be disappointed if you don't give class. So I thought, hmm. can't argue with the temple president. <laughs> But then I started to think, well, 
I should have wrote, if you come, then I'll come. <laughs> I forgot to write that. <laughs> but you came anyway, so that was good. <laughs> so, yeah, my, I was thinking, because I, I got backed up after the weekend with other services, and I was thinking, and now I'm going to use Monday to, Monday to catch up. Fortunately, the rest of the day went really good, so I did a lot of catch up. <laughs> But then when it came time for the middle of the day, I was thinking, hmm, maybe I can get out of it. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. Now, when I, came into the, when I came into the class, when I came into the temple today, I was thinking, all right, I'll finish by 8.20. No, I'm, no, 7.20. I mean, that was the... <laughs> but then... Then I thought, then I remembered that Krishna consciousness is constant. So if you're not giving yourself at every minute to your full capacity, you're going to go down. So I'm in this situation, so I have to give my full capacity and not just try to get it over with. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah, so... I at least tried anyway. That was my, my endeavor. So, yeah, so in whatever situation you're in, Krishna is really giving you the, the intelligence to figure out how best you can use that situation for instruction. Now, Ananta did say one thing, make, it, make the class short and sweet. So I think, short, that was easy. But then I thought, make it sweet. So then I came up with... I came up with the idea, so, <laughs> so that that makes it, that makes it sweet. So I was simply wanted to obey the temple president's instructions. <laughs> well, it's now this me and you are together anyway. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not going to become temple president. <laughs> okay, so just to fulfill Ananta's request, please come up and get the sweet part. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki.